Hi, my name is Michael Jude. In our first video lesson, we noted that the number four most searched query on Google in 2014 is, what is Bitcoin? It's a simple enough question, but it tends to get some pretty confusing answers. We'll keep it simple for you, but it's important to look at the history as well as the future of where global commerce is heading. In other words, the past, the present, and the future of money. The correct answer to the question, what is Bitcoin, is that Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency to emerge. But what does that really mean? Let's start with a more basic question, one that most people usually don't ask themselves, and that is, what is money? Money, ultimately, is the tool that people use to exchange, store, or account for value. Throughout history, we've used many different things as money, from seashells to precious metals to bits of paper and plastic, and even things like sea salt, feathers, and precious stones. But before there was money, all exchanges were based on credit or direct trades between two parties. Basically, it went like this. I'll trade you my watermelons for your goat. This system of direct exchange between two parties is commonly known as the barter system. The direct barter system goes back before recorded history when humans relied on barter as a simple way to exchange goods and services. Examples of items bartered include anything that was considered valuable, be it food, tools, weapons, materials, property, clothing, adornments, household wares, as well as domestic animals such as cattle and goats. But a very common problem arose. What if someone didn't want to trade their watermelons for your goats or they were simply out of season? Well, after that happened enough times, some anonymous genius thought up the idea of creating a common denominator of value that everyone agreed had a specific value. What we know today as money was born. Money as a common denominator and a medium of exchange was a way easier way than trying to arrange three-way and maybe even four-way or five-way exchanges. Historically, the most popular money has been gold. And there's a good reason for this. Gold works really well as money. It's rare, so it's hard to acquire. And it's tangible, so if it's in your hands, it's probably yours. It's also divisible, it's portable, and it's permanent. And this worked really well for thousands of years, no matter what happened around you. No matter who was the king or which government was in power at a particular time, gold simply worked. Then along came a new invention, paper money. When you think about it, for someone who has used gold for their whole life, paper money was hard to completely trust. The idea of relying on paper money instead of gold or silver was a difficult concept to sell to the general population. The Chinese were first to use paper currency around the year 100 uh, using materials such as linen, hemp, bamboo, and mulberry bark, which were lighter and much easier to carry than gold or silver. The Chinese had already developed the practice of writing credit notes on paper and deer skins as guarantees for long distance trade. In the West, paper money actually started out as a simple representation of gold. In 1786, 10 years after independence, the U.S. Congress authorized the issuance of the dollar by the U.S. government. And in 1792, the government created the U.S. Mint to manufacture and circulate coins. Early paper dollars from this period were called continentals. But they soon became inflated and worthless, giving rise to the term not worth a continental dam. 
It wasn't until the Civil War in 1861 that the government began regularly printing U.S. dollars for general circulation and redemption upon demand. During the Civil War, the South also created what is now called Confederate money to finance the war. As you probably know, Confederate money is now worthless and only valuable to script collectors. The U.S. dollar was originally meant to be a gold certificate, which is basically just a piece of paper saying that you own some gold that's sitting in a vault at the Treasury and that the U.S. government guarantees it. When paper money first started being used, people didn't trust the paper money itself. They trusted the government to hold the gold for them. It was the fact that the gold was in the vault that made people feel secure, not the paper representation. The dollar note served as a contract with the government and entitled the holder to exchange that note for the indicated amount of gold or silver. This was the beginning of the gold standard. During the Great Depression, every major country abandoned the gold standard. Among the first was the Bank of England. It abandoned the gold standard in 1931 as speculators demanded gold in exchange for paper currency, threatening the solvency of the British Empire. This pattern repeated throughout Europe and North America. In the United States, the Federal Reserve was forced during the Depression to raise interest rates in order to protect the gold standard for the US dollar, thereby worsening the already severe economic pressures. After bank runs became more common in the 1930s, people began to hoard gold coins as distrust for banks led to increased distrust for paper money, aggravating deflation and depleting gold reserves. This sparked the Gold Reserve Act in early 1933. In order to fight severe deflation, Congress and the President implemented a series of acts of Congress and executive orders which essentially suspended the gold standard except for other foreign government exchanges. These acts and orders revoked gold as universal legal tender for debts and banned private ownership of significant amounts of gold. These actions were upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Gold Clause Cases of 1935. These measures were meant to provide a temporary solution to fight the Great Depression. And in time, gold did return back to the U.S. dollar again. However, by 1971, President Richard Nixon unilaterally ordered the cancellation of the direct convertibility of the United States dollar to gold. This was known as the Nixon shock when he closed the gold window. With the Nixon shock act, gold backing of the US dollar was officially abandoned by the US government and the era of the gold standard finally ended. Since the 1970s and through today, the U.S. dollar is actually a fiat currency. Fiat is a Latin word for it shall be, which is just another way of saying, let's all just agree that this paper is worth something, even though there is no gold backing it. And the amazing thing is that the American people bought this obvious deception, hook, line, and sinker. It's self-evident. Just look around and you'll see people every day using fiat money and not realizing that a U.S. dollar is essentially worthless and that hard currency or tangible money is all but vanished. If you've never read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve by G. Edward Griffin, it's a must read. It's beyond the scope of this lesson to go into any detail, but Suffice it to say that the Federal Reserve is not a U.S. government institution. Rather, it's a private central bank owned by the most wealthy banks and banking families in the world. Families that literally control the flow, 
price and tracking of money. The creature from Jekyll Island will likely be the single most important book you have ever read. It will change the way you understand the US dollar and how the banking system really works. Okay, now back to paper money. Interestingly enough, paper fiat money is actually a form of digitization. That is, we're dealing with numbers, not rare physical metals, beads, or seashells. This does make paper money easier to count, manage, and move. In fact, the vast majority of money movement and storage these days is actually done by means of mere numbers in computers without involving physical paper as, at all. That's kind of scary when you actually think about it, especially knowing that this same digital money stored in your personal bank account or on your credit card has all its record keeping controlled through a privately owned central bank. And that this bank can be hacked or manipulated. Unlike gold or paper currency, there is no actual physical object that can be counted, confirmed, or restored in the event of a grid failure or a hack. So if money today is essentially digital, how does that work? If someone has an electronic entry that represents a dollar in their bank account, what's to stop someone from copying it digitally a thousand times and turning it into a thousand dollars? The solution that banks use today is called a centralized solution where they keep an electronic ledger on their computers which keeps track of who owns what. Everyone has a personal account and the central ledger keeps a record for everyone's account. People have to trust the bank and the bank has to trust their computers. It's pretty obvious why this might not be such a good idea. It's simply too easy for a few extremely powerful bankers to control everything, not to mention hackers who can focus their malicious intent on this one target. In October of 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonym or a pen name for an anonymous researcher or a team of researchers, published a paper on cryptocurrency describing Bitcoin digital currency and the blockchain. It was titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. In January of 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto released the first Bitcoin software and that launched the World Bitcoin Network. This paper described how to solve the problem of keeping an accurate ledger without a centralized solution, that is, without a central bank. He called it Bitcoin, and went on to describe how one can create a ledger which doesn't rely on a central bank. These ideas were revolutionary, and this launched the first decentralized solution to the security concerns associated with central banking. It first appeared as too good to be true and almost sounded like science fiction. How can something possibly be coordinated and smoothly integrated if it's decentralized? The funny thing is you actually already know the answer to this question. You're using a decentralized technology right now to watch this video. It's called the internet. Think about it for a moment. Nobody owns the internet. It's the most vast and powerful network humankind has ever created, and yet there's no internet company, there's no internet government. There's no one entity controlling it, so it's decentralized by default. There are millions of individuals and private companies who build infrastructure which resides on the internet. They come from countries spread all across the continents. They champion different ideologies, and yet it all works smoothly. The internet decentralizes information technology, just like Bitcoin decentralizes money and the movement of currency worldwide.
For every transaction of Bitcoin, all digital exchanges on the Bitcoin blockchain are recorded in a ledger. So far, this is the same as earlier with central banks. Everything's recorded on a ledger. The difference here, and this is really huge, is that with Bitcoin, the ledger is public and shared globally on the internet. This public ledger, or the record of all transactions that have ever occurred in Bitcoin, is maintained and kept by the public. Millions of people around the world have the same copy of the same ledger on their own computers, and anyone can download and verify this public ledger at any time. In Bitcoin, money is simply moved between Bitcoin addresses, kind of like the movement of emails from computer to computer. Usually people get concerned when they hear about Bitcoin's ledger being public. They ask, well, what about privacy problems? And like most privacy issues, it's complicated. Whatever you may have heard about Bitcoin, it's neither inherently anonymous nor inherently identifiable. This is because each Bitcoin sender and each Bitcoin receiver have part of their address information public, and at the same time, the other part of their address is very private. The beauty of the split information system is that both parts are required to create transactions. So the whole process becomes incredibly safe, being simultaneously part public and part private. We'll touch on this in a later video as it's a bit complex to fully explain in this overview. If you think this public ledger is easy to hack, it's not. And this is because of the architecture of what's known as the blockchain. As transactions occur, often many transactions per second worldwide, they're reviewed by thousands of computers owned by Bitcoin miners around the world. Now, Bitcoin miners are people on the internet who wish to earn Bitcoin by confirming transactions with their powerful computers and they bundle these transactions up into blocks of transactions that they confirm on the public ledger as being correct. We'll go into a more in-depth explanation of Bitcoin mining in later lessons, but for now, the key point I want to convey to you is that as blocks of Bitcoin transactions are verified to be correct, they're confirmed by numerous Bitcoin miners, often gathering 30 or more confirmations and they're then confirmed to the blockchain. The blockchain is just another name for the endless blocks of confirmed Bitcoin transactions that go all the way back to the beginning when the Bitcoin blockchain started in January of 2009. Think of it as a permanent history that tracks each and every transaction in a very secure way. This is why Bitcoin transactions are virtually impossible to hack. A hacker would have to hack into all the blockchain transactions on the entire blockchain to succeed, and that's impossible. There are too many blocks of transactions and too many computers worldwide. Satoshi Nakamoto's blockchain technology has created a 100% safe transaction platform. It's public, open sourced and protects all of its participants' privacy by encrypting the second part of their private codes within their public addresses. And there are countless copies of the Bitcoin blockchain ledger all over the world, so you can't fool everyone by hacking only some of the copies. So now that we have begun to explore the digital as well as the decentralized aspects of Bitcoin and the blockchain, we can finally say with more understanding, Bitcoin is the world's first decentralized digital currency. But why does all this matter? Can Bitcoin really change the world? Well, that's a question we'd all like to know the answer to, right? If a particular economy falls or a particular government changes, Bitcoin won't be affected like fiat currencies will. 
It's also far more internet friendly than a fiat currency, which means that online commerce can flourish much more easily. Surprisingly, the big winners are going to be the billions of people across Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world that have decent internet connections but horrible banks or no banks at all. For example, with my US bank, I can shop online and I can send money across the world, even though it's slow and quite expensive. But in parts of Africa, they use cell phone minutes as a medium of exchange. In other words, they use cell phone minutes like money. In Argentina, people are trading official government money on the black market or using US dollars because astronomical inflation makes it impossible to save money for an emergency or for retirement. Nationless currency, global money, is exactly what these people need. A global currency that works even if their governments or their banks are failing. These are exciting times. Many businesses have started accepting Bitcoin and other emerging cryptocurrencies all around the world. And some big names include Microsoft and Tiger Direct and a number of airlines. You can even buy a Tesla car with Bitcoins. And there are even Bitcoin ATMs all over the world. The implications for Bitcoin are profound. There are whole industries, fields of research, and grassroots movements growing day by day, and it's only getting bigger. It kind of reminds me of the 1990s when executives from AOL, computer scientists, and young students were all trying to explain to people what this thing called the internet is. A few far-seeing people grabbed that opportunity, and some of them today are billionaires. We've covered a lot of information in this module, and there's a lot for you to think about. I'm excited for you. This information is cutting edge. I suggest that you take your time, watch each of these video sections a few times, and really digest the material. I truly believe that what is happening right now and what will happen over the next few years will radically change everything about how we do business. A global transformation is happening right now, right here in this very moment. A new era is emerging and your position to take full advantage of it by educating yourself about this revolutionary new development. Thanks for your time and attention. We'll see you on the next video, which is a step-by-step -step breakdown of how to get started in the exciting world of cryptocurrency. Join us for lesson number three, how does cryptocurrency work?